And please join me in welcoming John as our next speaker this morning. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, Simon had asked me to initially speak about, you know, disruptions in, in, in healthcare and things like that. I lead innovation for Paul. Hello, I just saw you in this. I lead innovation for Omnicom Health Group, um, an agency called WildType. And it's my role to really get a sense of what are the latest technologies shaping the healthcare experience. And I actually spend most of my time outside of health in order to look at signals that can have an impact on our space. And then I called Simon and said, I called him from the hospital actually, and said, Simon, I may have another topic that might be um, even more interesting. Okay, so I'll just come out and say it straight away. This past summer, literally 100 days ago, I survived two open heart surgeries in less than three weeks. I'll just say that one more time. Two open heart surgeries in less than three weeks. Now here's the kicker, there's a kicker. It was caught purely by chance and I had no symptoms whatsoever, none. So you can imagine, and this is the first time I'm sharing this publicly on stage, so excuse me if I choke up at any moment you know, during, during this, it's, it's quite a lot to take in. Um, shock warning. But yes, this is a little bit about my experience. Okay. Now, as I said before, I had no symptoms whatsoever. And I went from being healthy to this. And it was a lot to take in. It was a, it was a huge um, stress for my wife, who was there every step of the way, and for my family, as you can imagine. I want to take you briefly through the treatment journey that got me to this stage today from where I was when it first started. Okay. I randomly had a brain bleed in January, okay? Totally random. I found out I had a leaky heart valve. I then had a bunch of cardiac tests. They had told me that I need surgery in the next two to 10 years. Like, what kind of, what kind of window is two to 10 years? I'm like, if for anybody, that would be mass confusion and panic. So I did a lot of research and find out what other tests can I take to narrow that ridiculously large window. We found out I also have an aortic aneurysm, which is a swelling of the aorta, the main pipe that comes out from the heart. The window started to narrow just a little bit from weeks to months. And then I had the first surgery on June 7 of this year. I had a lot of post-operative complications. I learned that no matter how young or healthy you go in, post-operative complications do not discriminate. I had my second open heart surgery 20 days later on June 27. I contacted, contracted staph infection. I had COVID for the third time in the hospital. And I had a third surgery on July 25. So this year has not been the funnest year so far for me. There's been a lot. So I decided to document my journey to the nth degree. I used technology at every step. And I lived my own case study. So there's something about reading research reports, working on marketing campaigns, helping brands. That is wonderful, and that's what I do for a living. But it's a little bit different when you're doing it on yourself. And tell you what, it was how it was very, very meaningful. So how did it all start? Let's wind back a little bit. Let's zoom out. We're going to do some zooming ins and zooming outs. Paul knows what I'm like when I'm presenting. I get very excited and caught up in a lot of the material. This was me over Christmas last year. Life is grand. I'm back home in Australia. I'm on the beaches. I'm with my family. I'm visiting my grandfather. Everything is just fantastic. My family and I went to Universal Studios in uh, February, I think it was. Oh, no, sorry, in, um, yeah, at the end of, uh, right, before, right before work started again, so early January. Everything's just perfect, amazing. It's my 10-year-old girl, Emmy. And my 8-year-old boy, Finn. 
I then had a business trip. I went to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Anyone go to CES in Vegas each year? Oh my goodness, we have to get more folks there. It is the technology showcase. It's the largest technology show on earth. And I visited a friend and we went cruising down PCH in Malibu in his convertible. And then 17 hours later, I was taken off to the hospital due to a, a brain bleed, which was incredibly, incredibly shocking. And my wife flew out to meet me there the next morning. So how do we deal with this? How do we make sense with this God-awful experience that had landed on my lap? Why me? How me? What did we do? My wife went straight to Google before she flew out to meet me. She Googled what they determined or were starting to narrow in on as to what happened to me in terms of the brain bleed. Had a massive thunderclap headache. She Googled subarachnoid hemorrhage, which was what I was diagnosed with. Okay, and this is what she got. She got a link. Okay, she got a couple of questions here. What is life like after a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Here's some treatment and information. And here's some huge, scary information about potentially leading to death. So you can imagine she has massive panic. I didn't tell her to go to ChatGPT. She went to ChatGPT. Okay. She went there because she wanted to know a little bit more than what she was getting from Google. Okay? So, she says, my husband just had a crazy bad headache. He went to the emergency room. He was vomiting everywhere. They tell him it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It's a bleeding between the brain and the tissue that covers it. Okay? This usually happens because of a burst blood vessel. All right? And then some other information there. Here's what's important to know. Immediate care is crucial. That's good. I'm in the hospital already. Here's some treatment options. So you start to see that she's not just getting a couple of quick hits from Google. She's getting rationale and reasoning. And this is just ChatGPT. It wasn't built for medical use. So I've said this before, and I write about this a lot on LinkedIn. If you want a web page, you can go to Google. You can search in Google. Okay, if you want a link. And yes, they're getting better with providing a couple of snippets up the top. But if you want an answer, you go to artificial intelligence. You use AI. Okay? If you want a web page, go to Google. If you want an answer, you can use AI. So, we determined, they determined during many different tests to understand where this brain bleed came from. They determined in a CT scan that I had a bicuspid aortic valve. We were like, what? And they told me it wasn't an emergency. The emergency is the skull condition that generally eventually healed itself. I didn't need a procedure. But this condition affects 2% of the US population. I had the leaky heart valve as well. So my heart was working on overdrive to pump blood through the body. But I had no symptoms. I also had a dangerous bulge in my aorta that was at risk of dissection or rupture. And unless you're in an emergency room, when this happens, then there's no chance. So I was basically living on borrowed time without even knowing it, which is dreadfully scary. So normally on the left side, my use of AI, like I said, for brands, um, at various talks and keynote presentations I provide on the benefits, how it can be used, organizational transformation, all of this, pivoted very, very quickly to me using it for myself, understanding more about my condition, getting some insights that helped me prepare questions. Okay, and it wasn't perfect. We talked about hallucinations earlier, but gosh, it got me 90% of the way there. This was a huge transformation for me. During the course of my time this year, I had tons of things thrown at me. Many different scans, many different surgeon interviews, so many questions that I had prepared or that were asked of me, the types of surgeries and the amount of um, absolutely wonderful healthcare professionals that I interacted with. That is a lot for anybody to process. You can't use Google and you can't search and you can't get all of this information 
Okay, it is a lot. So how did I lean on AI in the most purposeful way based on all my experience so far? I used it to make sense of the difficulty, to translate, even though at Omnicom Health Group, I work very closely with HCPs and patients. So this is my domain. This is kind of what I do. But yet when it's, you're faced with it yourself, it is utterly, completely and utterly overwhelming. I used it to translate my condition so my children can understand. You'll see in a moment. I created AI bots on my surgeon. I scoured the web for everything I could find that was out there publicly on my surgeon. The transcript of every YouTube video they were in, any article they had written, and I trained an AI bot so I could have access to ask questions at 3 a.m. 24-7, I had a personal surgical assistant in my pocket. It was transformational. I worked on my own recovery plans and a big one down the bottom, the emotional support and the coaching. So here's an example. In ChatGPT, I built a lot of custom bots and I asked it things like, if I have no symptoms, but radiology scans show this bicuspid valve um, and severe regurgitation, what do I need to do? How do I cope? And I got a lot of wonderful information that I could then cross-check and help prepare questions for. Run against Google. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that helped me be more confident, helped me get the right answers that make sense for me, but then I wanted to do a lot of research as well. Okay, this is perplexity. For those that haven't used perplexity, it is the AI research tool, okay? You can put in complex things. I'm asking it to act as a cardiac surgeon. I want the latest research of valve sparing procedures for heart surgery for folks my age, okay? So the beauty about perplexity is it's verified source links. So you actually get further reading and all of its information is pulled from verifiable links. So you can see it finds its sources, it provides its answer, and then it gives you those annotations to go and read further. So it's not, so the hallucinations are dramatically reduced, or at least your use of them are reduced, because you can go to these links and actually read from um, quoted materials. And it can give you fascinating insights into a medical condition. Any Swifty fans in the house? Okay, yes, yes. My wife was in Miami a few weekends ago for, for the show, Pouring Rain show, um, it was very awesome. And my 10 year old daughter's a big Swifty. And so I'm racking my brain thinking, how on earth can I try to explain daddy's condition to her when it's difficult for me to even understand or explain? So I took my medical condition I first asked ChatGPT, do you know Taylor Swift songs? Yes, it's familiar with Taylor Swift's music. And I said, I'd like you to take Taylor Swift's song lyrics and trivia and translate this in my condition into something my 10-year-old daughter can understand. So this was magical. And this was something that was really purposeful. And I knew I landed on something special here. So it's, it started going through this. And I had a lot of back and forth. I started asking more questions. I shaped the lyrics a little bit. But look, it brought up um, me, shake it off. <laughs> and then it was taking my condition of a bicuspid valve. And it was blending the two together, creating these original song lyrics. <laughs> and I just thought, my gosh, this is pretty fantastic. Now, my eight-year-old son is a huge basketball fan. OK, so I'm like, how can I use the mechanics of basketball to describe my condition? And I made some images in Dali as well. And I said, I'd like you to ask as, act as an expert cardiac surgeon. Notice the context I'm providing and the instructions I'm providing. Because these models pull from the vast corners of the web. Unless you point it into the direction of knowledge you want it to come from, you can get a lot of really broad information. So when you say, act as an expert cardiac surgeon, you are familiar with this and this, my condition. I'd like you to use a simple basketball scenario analogy using Magic and Michael, two of his favorite players, to, uh, to provide this and keep it as closely aligned as possible as the game of basketball. So you probably won't be able to read it all, but all this is on my LinkedIn. I'll, I'll provide a QR code in a moment. But um, 
It's like, imagine Michael Jordan is trying to shoot a basket, Magic Johnson swapping it out, can't get the basketball in the hoop. They align that to a, a, bicuspid, a, a, a regurgitation whereby the valve doesn't close properly, it's always open a little bit, and so he can't shoot it in the basket. These fascinating analogies. And I was like, wow, I've really stumbled on something here, the translation. And this is just to a young child. Imagine how you could do it for many other people. Now, I also talked about how I trained AI bots on my surgeon. So like I said, I scoured the web, and I loaded various different files in pure text file about certain types of... Um, uh, conditions that my surgeon had written about. Uh, the surgical process through his own words um, and also about my surgeon, Dr. Roselli. And I showed this to him and he was, he was pretty, pretty blown away. And then I started getting a little bit deeper into creating some custom GPTs. For those that are aware, you can create custom GPTs that are um, little bots where you can ask recurring questions over time. And so you can create a couple of uh, hot areas here as well to click on. So I, one of the most common things that I found in my research, a lot of people were asking was, you know, explain aortic aneurysm, all about this information. And it was really fascinating and I started to realize that, gosh, maybe it's not just me that can benefit from a lot of this information. Maybe there are others that may want to use this or may want a certain additional level of clarity or comfort as they're facing a a difficult journey. You know, at every stage you saw in my treatment journey I laid out there, I had questions, I had information. I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was getting into. This helped me prepare questions for my upcoming surgical visits, meetings with my care team. I was already a curious patient and pretty comfortable with technology, but I was, I was like a super injection of intelligence. Like, remember that movie, The Matrix? Um, Keanu Reeves needed, um, they needed to fly a helicopter. So he asked his uh, assistant, I need a, a flight plan for a so-and-so helicopter. And then he gets that injected in the back of his head. All of a sudden, he has a skill to become a helicopter pilot. He can fly it. This is like a super injection of intelligence for me. I all of a sudden went from not knowing anything about the heart to knowing enough to be able to confidently talk about my own condition. It was pretty amazing. Unfortunately, things got a little bit worse for me after the first surgery. My, my wife and I were at Cleveland Airport. We were discharged finally after all the complications. And we got a call from the hospital. And they said, we found something that we don't like in your recent scans. Some more doctors have looked at it. We need you to come back. We were moments away from boarding our plane. We left, came back to the hospital. I had an additional scan called a TEE, a transesophageal echocardiogram, where they put you to sleep, put a camera down the throat and get high definition pictures of the heart. They came back, 110 beats per minute, wow. They came back and they told us that there's another valve, your mitral valve, which now has a severe regurgitation and a prolapse. And we were like, what? I just had my aortic valve repaired and, the an and an aneurysm fixed. And now I have a mitral valve leakage? What is this? And I said, well, surely there's some non-invasive, you know, way to approach this or work over time to monitor it. And they said, no, you need, you need open heart surgery again, all over again. And my wife and our whole world just came crashing down. And we said, when? And they said, tomorrow. This is in less than three weeks. So this time it was getting real. There was no way that I could get through this with just my wife's support and the wonderful care team out there. I needed more. So I asked AI. I told it everything I'd been through. I set the context. And I said that I need you to help me be a mindset coach. I need a coach to get through the next week or two 
because it's going to be hell on earth. And I know the stages because I've lived it. I know what it's like to wake up coming out of the ICU with a breathing tube down your throat that they don't take out for about 20 minutes. I know what it's like to have the pain and the deliriousness of all the medicine. So I asked it for this and it worked with me and it helped guide me through. So I had an additional partner in my care team. Artificial intelligence and the various different platforms that I used, ChatGPT, Claude, Perplexity, etc. It was a lot. In some of the darkest moments, the most confusion when I was struggling for breaths, I would take photos of my vital signs behind me. I would remind it of the context. I'm a male, age 44, just had one surgery, just come out of the second. Here's my situation. What are these vitals showing me at the moment? Because no one's coming in to help me at this point. I needed some help. I pressed the button. It took them about 10 minutes to come in. I needed answers now. My wife is curious as well. So I used AI at every possible moment I could. This is my surgeon, Dr. Eric Roselli, a world-renowned uh, chief cardiothoracic surgeon at Cleveland Clinic. It took me a lot of research and luck to find my way to Dr. Eric Roselli. And he was, he was wonderful and he was very interested in my use of AI. This is he and I now um, sharing some examples, much like I did with you, of how I used it to help me get through this. And he was absolutely fascinated. He and I are having a couple more meetings and he's interested in learning more about where I am so far. So I'm slowly seeing the light at this, through this journey. Okay, slowly seeing the light. My wife and I head out to Cleveland for our three-month post-operative visit. And keep in mind, I've had a million scans, a million, million checks. Given I had staph infection, I had a pick line inserted in my arm. I had to self-medicate. My incision was leaking. I had to have a wound vac machine and a debridement process. And changing the dressing on that incision was the most barbaric pain I had ever experienced in my life. Three months post-op, everything started to heal. So we go out to Cleveland Clinic and we're ready. We have more scans. The valves look great. Things are working very, very well. We're very pleased. But I'm like, you know, I want to look for, I'm still asking why, how and why this happened. I'm looking for, is there any connection between the brain bleed I had in January and the discovery of my heart valve problem and ultimately the need for surgeries. And so I found some pretty special connections by going back to perplexity, the research engine, if you remember. And it gave me a lot of really interesting things. It gave me a lot of sources to read up on and it told me about some of the connections and I found out that um, I needed to go and have testing for uh, potential congenital condition of, um, of where blood vessels aren't necessarily as formed as, as well as they should be. And so I went to have genetic testing at, at um, Yale in New Haven and I'm waiting for those results now because there, is a, there apparently are strong connections between the two of them, which is very, very interesting. Um, about three and a half weeks ago, I was laying in bed one night and my heart rate raced to 120, laying down flat watching TV with my wife. We were three months out of the health system. We thought we were home free. And so I called the Cleveland Clinic 24 hour number and they said, monitor it, take one more piece of this medicine see how it is in the morning. I woke up 120. I was running a marathon in my sleep all through the night, basically. Had to go into my local hospital, the wonderful people at Stanford Health in Connecticut. I had to be put to sleep and I had to be shocked, shocked back to heart rhythm, a cardio version. So what that does is, remember the movie Flatliners in the 80s and 90s? Um, they put you to sleep and they shock you back to rhythm. And I was maintained back at 80. And I had two nights on there. And my kids came to visit me and my, my, daughter, my daughter left this message on the window. I didn't see it until uh, the next morning when, she, when they came to get me. 
because I was close to home at this point. I wasn't, you know, an hour and a half flight away from, from, from home. They told me that my condition initially for heart surgery was a seven-day routine stay. Seven days turned into 40 days, 40 nights, a lot of complications, two surgeries, and over a month away from my children. It was a lot to take in. Here's us leaving the hospital for the final time uh, about uh, three and a half weeks ago. Touch wood, final time. They were caught up in a lot of this. And, you know, I think I said this in the beginning that I honestly feel that the future of the patient experience is wholly, wholeheartedly, um, maybe even driven by AI, but AI is a part of the future of the patient experience. I lived it, okay? And yes, I'm curious, I'm technically savvy, but these tools are becoming faster and more simple to use. I've shared my story throughout the past couple of months online. Um, everything I found, everyone I worked with, all the great tips that I had along the way. And I thought, as I mentioned earlier, you know, how can I help others along this journey? Because it's not just me that's going through this. I found two wonderful Facebook groups about heart valve surgery, each of which have at least 17 and a half thousand members in the US, actually globally. So that's about 40,000 people right there that are either facing, have had, or know somebody that's had open heart surgery for valve repair. So if you remember, I talked earlier about decoding complexities, translating the condition, creating bots to help answer repeated questions, personalizing recovery plan, and most importantly, a lot of that emotional support. I experienced wonderful care at the Cleveland Clinic and Stanford Health. But there's a difference between wonderful care and the personal moments and the thoughts in your mind of every question that you don't get answered. There's a gap in the middle, okay? So there's so many people that are living through this and experiencing the confusion and anxiety associated with complex medical conditions, especially heart disease. And yes, that's an AI-generated image. I thought, first of all, I realized when I was standing after they had told me you need a second open heart surgery tomorrow, why me? There must be a reason that this has happened to me twice. And it dawned on me that you know, I was using AI for many different other things, for other companies, for fun, for, for enjoyment. And I realized I was born to tell this story. I was born to use my enthusiasm and, and experience in AI. I was born to live through this and help others go through that same process. And so that gap from anxiety not knowing and researching on Google and waiting to see a doctor, there's a special place in the middle. That place in the middle is where I think I can add value, a lot of value to patients. And there's a lot of information from my experience and my research that I can help provide to patients. So I've created a program that, I'm, that is launched, that is up, where I'm helping other patients and I'm working with patients. It's called Hearts and Algorithms. And it is capturing everything that I learned in my journey and the curious nature of translating questions and problems into structured prompts into ways to be able to get the kind of answers and insights that you need. And this probably maybe is my life's mission. It's an AI-powered platform, and it leans into that empathy and coaching space. It does not provide medical advice. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a surgeon. I'm not a physician. But you probably won't find too many technologists that have lived two open heart surgeries in three weeks. So I think I know a little bit about what's happening. So I want to lean into my space, which is the empathy, support, and coaching. And I want to help train AI models to provide that for future patients. Helpful tips on what to expect and guidance for treaters. I'm lucky enough to have a friend in Los Angeles, Dr. Kathy Magliardo. She's a um, nationally recognized female cardiac surgeon and 
They made a TV show about her on NBC called Heartbeat. Melissa George played her. Um, she's also launching a new product. Um, it's a smart cuff for heart patients. She is coming on board as an advisor. She believes in this. She helped me a lot. We had a bat phone to her during my difficult journey and she answered a lot of great questions and it reminded me that that empathy coach is something that people need. I'm working with a bunch of people already in these Facebook groups, offering my help, offering my phone number, offering my use of AI to test, is this actually a value provided offering? Will others benefit from this and use this? I've had some wonderful responses, feedback, I've helped a lot of people already, and it feels wonderful to be able to give back. I want to leave you with these last two things. I was invited by a cardiologist at Stanford Health. I go there uh, three or four times a week for cardiac rehab. There's a wonderful center down in Stanford called the Tully Center. They cover my chest with electrodes, give me a, a, a walking pack, much like this and I do my exercise and they monitor me live on the screens. It's, it's really wonderful. I'm halfway through the program. Dr. Edward Schuster gave a talk on how to live to 120. There were some pretty special takeaways there. The Mediterranean diet, he said, is proven to uh, help prevent Alzheimer's cancer and heart disease. He talked about cholesterol. He said, you can't be too rich, too skinny, or have too low of an LDL. Exercise. He's like, he I don't care what you do, walking, swimming, biking, just do it. You'll cut your risk in half for heart disease. On longevity and stress. Stress matters a lot. Laugh a lot. Put family first. Enjoy weekends. And his view on vitamins. Doesn't really like them that much. The vitamins in olives, fish, nuts, oil and vegetables prevent cancer and heart disease. When you put them in a pill and you get them from, say, another country, they don't work as well. I had my birthday in hospital between the two surgeries. When I was able to walk around a little bit, we went down to the gift shop. I found this book and my wife surprised me with it on my birthday a couple of days later. It's called 4,000 Weeks. Big shock to the system. You have 4,000 weeks to live on this planet, roughly. And between the two surgeries, I had 1,872 left. This experience reminded me of what I was born to do, what matters in life, and how to reset priorities. And I hope this was an interesting experience for you to see how someone has been through a life-changing event, used AI in a purposeful way, made the best of the different various models out there, and put something together that can help patients moving forward. I write and talk a lot about this, and so if you're interested in learning more, um, please follow me. But um, I want to thank you all for your time and Simon for having me. Thank you, John. Incredible. Really, really powerful message to kind of end the, the morning se session on. Um, real, real quick, I know we've got a break coming up now for sort of just, just under 30 minutes, but does anybody want to, um, you know, pose any questions or comments? Obviously, that was an incredible story that John shared with us there. Gives a lot, us a lot to think about beyond the, the, uh, the workflow. And, um, yeah, anybody want to chime in with questions. John's going to be around for the next day and a half anyway, um, uh, if, if you'd like to catch up with him in, individually. But any questions, comments? Yes. Uh, hey, John. Thanks for your story. Um, incredibly powerful, inspiring. The question I have is, you, you, there was a slide that flashed where you said that you met with, I think, 26 different specialists. So I'm curious, was there a, a tool, whether AI or not, um, that you use to track all of the information you were getting in each one of those visits to be able to then prompt the AI with the, the information that you wanted? Yeah, good, great question. Yeah, there's a lot of specialists we met with, a lot of different appointments. Um, I was lucky enough to have my wife with me at every stage and between the two of us collecting notes, um, uh, voice recordings that we kept for our own purposes, of course, um, that we were able to kind of relive and, 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 and revisit because you just, you just can't, in such an emotionally charged visit, you cannot take in all these signals and remember everything. So we would record conversations um, with consent from the doctors, of course, and use that for our own personal use to revisit that and then take notes again for anything that we had missed. 
And then from those notes and from those insights, we're able to formulate you know, the right questions and the right inputs to structure some of the prompts. And as I had mentioned before, um, you know, a lot of people who, hands up, who, who has used ChatGPT or Perplexity or, or Claude? Okay, okay, not as, okay, good, a little bit more. Do you remember the first time you used it? It wasn't kind of that great, right? You were like, oh yeah, it's kind of cool, interesting, I made a recipe, I made a song, a bedtime story for my children, great. But unless you set the context, that's where the magic happens, okay? Setting the context, setting the persona, specifying the type of output that you want, really helps provide a lot more clarity and guess where you get the real wow factor. So in, in, in long story short, it was listening, notes, recordings, using those to help structure great questions and then working with the output and not stopping with the first response. It's an ongoing conversation. Thank you. You are incredible. This was amazing. Not at all what I expected from this kind of experience. So thank you so much. Um, you came at this from like a strong foundation. Your technical abilities, your, your just interest in all of these different tools. Someone like me who doesn't necessarily have that foundation but could find themselves in this situation tomorrow, where would you say to start? Like the, if I just don't, yeah, I've used chat GPT five times. I like kind of get it, but like what else? Where do I go? Yeah, it, that is one of the number one reasons why I created Hearts and Algorithms. First thing you would do is Google Hearts and Algorithms. Um, but no, I, I, it starts with a, a healthy curiosity and a, a frustration with Google. Google points you to big complex articles. It gives you all the information and I think one of the first things I would do is become curious and start to think about how can I work with AI to try to help me get there. For me, what was a big click early on, two years ago now, I guess, it was trying to unlearn how to talk to computers. Because we're trained to go to Google, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage symptoms. We, we talk to a computer like, like it's a robot. The conversational nature of, of artificial intelligence and these models is what really kind of made a flip switch, switch flip for me, which was now I'm, t I'm understanding how to, have a, how to have a human like conversation with a machine. And that's where you get the best answers back. You know, I wrote an article literally about this, it's on LinkedIn called, you know, How to Talk Human Again. And I think we reached a point where we're moving from yelling at our Alexa, hey Alexa, play Dua Lipa. <laughs> we're moving to a, give me Dua Lipa's top 10 songs on repeat. You know, so it's, it's a different conversation. So not only is there curiosity, there it built from a frustration of Google, but it was also relearning how to talk human to machines again. And that's where the real power kind of unlocks. Um, so that's definitely a, a good starting point where I think about. Yes. And uh, Evan. Yeah, so w likewise, um, not, not what I was expecting at all, and that, that was a wild ride, um, incredibly inspirational, and actually crazy parallel on my part that I'd like to talk to you about afterwards. Please. But um, my, my question is, it looks like you're leveraging primarily ChatGPT there. Um, do you recommend the free or the, the paid version of it? And if so, why? Yeah, great, great question. Um, uh, ChatGPT grabs a lot of media attention, obviously, because it exploded onto the scene. It's the world's most valuable company in the shortest amount of time, the most downloaded app, fastest in history. So there's a reason why it captures a lot of the limelight. ChatGPT was definitely one of them, but perplexity, was another one, that's the research-based tool. Um, Claude by Anthropic was another one that I leaned into heavily. Those are really my kind of top three, and I would go between them. But I would say ChatGPT from a starting point. Now the paid version, what that does is it unlocks a lot of the traffic volume barriers. You know, half the world's typing in prompts every second, 24-7, so it puts a lot of strain on the system when you pay for the paid version, you get 
um, more priority access to the compute power so you don't get capped as much. So it won't say, you know, no more prompts until 7 p.m. You, know, you can keep going with it. So you paid, you get more. But if you're just using it for the first time or getting kind of familiar with it, the free version is all you need, absolutely. Um, there's also a couple of extra features. ChatGPT releases, releases features all the time um, that help developers, writers, things like that. So you get access to a few different features. But it's only, I think, $10 a month or whatever. But if you're just starting out, the free version's certainly sufficient, yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Evan. Um, obviously, John's going to be around uh, the next day and a half as well. So definitely you know, grab the opportunity to, to, to converse and, and connect with him um, when, when, when you have time. But let's, let's give John a wonderful round of applause again. That was fantastic. Really appreciate it.